So I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and, uh, and my lab focuses on trying to understand how the, how the brain works. So, so the talk is really about how do we go about engineering the brain. Um, the brain is one of the most complex systems in, the entire, uh, or in our entire body, and we know the least amount about how the brain is organized and how the brain carries out very sophisticated uh, behavioral computational uh, functions. So every thought, everything that we think about or remember uh, is mediated by this really complex organ. This is a picture of the human brain. Um, the brain is complex at every single level. So if you just zoom in to a small part of the brain and you look at it under the microscope, you will see that the brain is composed of very diverse um, types of cells. And uh, they are called neurons. Each one of these neurons, they don't function by themselves. They actually connect to many other neurons in the brain and they form a network. It's this network very much like a computer circuit that allows the brain to carry out computations, to remember things, and to be able to send out commands to control your body. These neurons, they send signals to each other. So these uh, red spots that you see here are called action potentials, uh, the signals that are propagated from one neuron to the other. And, um, and if you just zoom into the cell uh, a little more, you'll see that even within a single neuron is extremely sophisticated. Um, Within the cell, uh, there are many different organelles. Uh, here's the nucleus, there are mitochondria around, and then there are uh, endoplasmic reticulum and many other parts of the cell. And if you zoom into the nucleus again, you see that the, the cell's nucleus is as well uh, very complicated. Within the nucleus, there are chromo uh, chromosomes uh, that uh, basically encode the, the blueprint, the DNA, the genome uh, for this neuron. So going all the way from the brain all the way to a, to a neural circuit, to individual neuron, and down to the genomic level, every single level, there are very complicated interactions. And when something goes wrong at any one of these levels, uh, there can be very devastating consequences. <clears throat> so what we want to do is try to understand how does a molecule lead to the properties of a cell, and how do the cells organize into complex circuits to carry out computation, and then finally, how do they form this brain that allow us to think, to know who we are, and to, to manifest very uh, com complex uh, behaviors like creativity or emotion and so forth. But of course, any part in this big uh, system uh, goes wrong, uh, there can be very devastating consequences. So here are just a list of some of the neurological and psychiatric disorders, and you can, you can see for most of Actually, for all of these disorders, we know very little about the disease mechanism, and what is in common is that we don't really have a treatment uh, for, for any of them. But a work by many, many laboratories over the past uh, several decades have really begun to highlight uh, that there is things happening at a circuit level and also happening at the genetic level in the, in the cells in the brain that causes uh, these kinds of disease. So the research in my lab really focuses on trying to understand how do circuit functions result and how the circuit functions combined with genetic predis predispositions uh, result in sophisticated and, and devastating uh, neurological diseases. But because the brain is so complicated, um, in order to understand this complex system, uh, we need new tools. Uh, because the brain cells are very uh, minute, and um, using very, uh, very brute force uh, surgical methods or very, uh, uh, very blunt kind of uh, approaches uh, cannot allow us to look at the specific cell types or the specific circuits within the brain and try to figure out what is going uh, on uh, that causes disease. The way we go about developing uh, new tools uh, is really um, inspired by many of the things uh, that are available in nature. So we use uh, what's called synthetic biology so if you just look around you, um, in the trees, in the microorganisms, uh, in the water, uh, there are organisms that have evolved very, very sophisticated, very intricate functions in order to survive in those ecological environments. And uh, what we do is that we take some of those functions that don't, uh, are not <coughs> present within the mammalian uh, system, within our bodies, and we transplant those things from the microorganisms and put those into the mammalian cells so that we can um, enable new functions so that we can control or try to study uh, how the brain works better. 
So I want to give you uh, three examples of how we were able to develop tools uh, that uh, facilitate the understanding of uh, brain function. So the first one is how do we go about using pond scum uh, to correct brain activity? Uh, there are very distinct, very uh, um, sort of unrelated things, but I'll tell you how they are related. The second thing is about how do we use rice pathogen, uh, a protein found in these rice, uh, rice pathogens, to be, able, to be able to repair genetic mutations that cause diseases. And then uh, the third one, I'll, I'll give you some other uh, interesting possibilities. So for the very first example, um, this really uh, derives from a clinical treatment that uh, are available today for treating Parkinson's disease. And this is called deep brain stimulation. The way that deep brain stimulation works is they, the surgeon will implant two electrodes directly into the brain. And uh, these electrodes will send out electrical currents that uh, stimulate the cells in that region. So you zap the cells uh, in the vicinity of this electrode, and that's able to alleviate uh, the motor tremors uh, in Parkinsonian patients. I'll show you a movie um, of what this uh, treatment looks like. So this is a, this is a YouTube video. Uh, so this woman um, has Parkinson's the disease. important safety information at the end of the video. This Only is the most important can part. determine if this therapy is right for you. Okay. So, th so this is a woman who uh, you can see she has um, lost some of the fine motor control, uh, so suffering a lot of a tremor. And, uh, and she has sort of a late stage Parkinson's disease. <clears throat> and with the DBS in, uh, electrode implant and turn on and stimulating, uh, then she's able to basically regain normal control, uh, so no longer uh, sort of shakes. And you can see that she can, uh, she couldn't really walk very normally uh, without the stimulation. Maybe and after the, okay, for that's Parkinson's enough. Disease. <clears throat> so, um, so, so, so this is a very powerful therapy. Um, and uh, and it's, it's uh, implanted in over 100,000 patients worldwide. Um, but what is, um, what is important to notice from this clinical treatment is that um, when the doctors implant these electrodes in any other part of the brain, uh, they don't really uh, correct the disease state. So there, there is something special about what the uh, cell, uh, what the electrode is stimulating in this area that gives rise uh, to this kind of therapeutic uh, result. So there are probably other parts in the brain that you can stimulate to correct other diseases. So what we want to do is try to be able to figure out what are the other parts of the brain uh, doing and how uh, those other parts uh, contribute uh, to different kinds of uh, disease or even therapeutic outcome. Uh, so these electrodes send out high frequency stimulation that turn off some of the cells in this area. Um, but it's unclear whether or not that's the direct uh, result. That's the direct uh, therapeutic result. Uh, it may be, um, so actually, so all of the brain cells are uh, responsive to electrical stimulation. So when you stimulate in this area, you not only stimulate the cells in this area, but also many of the connections uh, from other parts of the brain that are passing through. Um, so we don't uh, really fully understand what, what this is doing right now. We, we really, we, all we know really is that it's therapeutically efficacious. Um, and, and in this treatment, because the stimulation is not specific, um, it can have side effects because it's stimulating some therapeutic population, but also modulating other cells. Um, and so one thing that we need to do is actually figure out what is the cell that contributes to the therapeutic outcome and then only uh, modulate those cells. Yeah? What are the side effects? Uh, there can be muscle uh, twitches on the face. Uh, some people experience uh, signs of depression uh, affecting their, their emotional regulation. Um, and then there can be other speech impairments as well. Um, so. Um, so just to, uh, just to, to highlight uh, one thing, which is that the deep brain stimulation using an electrical uh, wire uh, is not very specific. So uh, if you imagine this is the brain region and there are two nerves passing through. One of the nerves is the nerve that you want to target that give you the therapeutic effect, and the other one is just a, uh, a nerve that's nearby. The electrical lead will stimulate both nerves. So you, even though you get a therapeutic outcome, uh, you can also get side effects depending on which uh, adjacent nerve you are, you are uh, controlling. So because of this, uh, we need to develop a, a more specific uh, modulation uh, methodology. 
And the method that we uh, develop uh, uses light rather than uh, electrical current. Most of the cells, uh, actually basically all the cells uh, deep in the brain are not responsive to light. So if we can somehow engineer the cells that we want to control to be able to respond to light, then we can just put an optical fiber in the brain, just like we put an electrical wire in the brain, and then shine light in that region, and only the cell that has been uh, engineered to respond to light will become modulated. And that way we can overcome uh, any side effect that electrical stimulation introduces. So, so we um, set out to develop a way so that we can specifically control um, a specific set of cells in the brain. And the way we do that is we uh, look to the, the pond scum, the green algae. And it turns out that the green algae has a protein uh, in the algae that senses light. It's a light receptor. And, um, and what we did is we borrowed the gene from this algae, and then we transplanted this gene into the neurons. So once this gene for the light receptor is in the neuron, then the light receptor be, uh, becomes expressed on the neuronal membrane, and then the neuron is all of a sudden light sensitive. So with, in this system, we can use genetic strategies to be able to introduce this gene only into the cells that we want to control. And that way, uh, we can just shine light in a population of cells, and only the cells that receive the gene uh, will become modulated. And, um, and so now, we can just shine blue light and then control the cells. The way we introduce these genes uh, into neurons is by using a virus to, to send in the gene. And so this is a picture of what, uh, what a virus uh, looks like. The way we modify the virus is we, uh, we re remove the viral genome, so we take out all the toxic genes that cause problems, and then we insert in the gene that, uh, that encodes this light receptor. So when the virus uh, is injected into the brain, uh, the virus will infect the cells, but it will only deliver uh, whatever gene that we put into the middle of the virus. In this case, it's, it's the light-sensitive protein. Yeah? How do, you know, how do you know what cell the virus is going to affect? Um, so this virus will actually enter most of the cells that it touches. Uh, so, it's, so, we can, uh, so there are ways that we can control it, but this virus we're using, uh, it will get into all the cells. But what we uh, engineer is that we change the genome of the virus so that the gene is only turned on in the right kind of cell. So even though the virus gets into all the cells, uh, it's only turned on in the cell that we want it to. Uh, that's a really smart question. <clears throat> so this is what, what it looks like once we uh, put it into the brain. This is the part of the brain called the hippocampus. And uh, after we inject in the virus, uh, only the cells in this part of the, the hippocampus uh, uh, expresses the gene. So the hippocampus is a region of the brain that's involved in learning and memory, and, uh, and this is one of the first regions that, that we try to target. Just to show you what, uh, what this actually looks like, uh, these, are, uh, these lines are called action potential. So each one of these lines is a, is a single action potential. And these action potentials are what uh, neurons use uh, to talk to each other. So when a neuron A wants to talk to neuron B, it will send out, send out one of these action potentials. And in the brain, uh, action potentials can come in any type of pattern. So it can come in at slower speed or faster speed and even faster speed. And this is how the neuron communicate with each other. So by changing uh, the pattern of these action potentials, uh, the neuron is able to send different messages to each other. And so what we showed over here is that we can directly use light. Every single uh, blue uh, dot you see here is a single light flash. It's very short. It's five milliseconds long. So that's five uh, one thousandths of a second. So you can have two hundreds of these per second. And, um, and so every single light flash causes uh, a action potential within the cell. So basically, you can go into the brain and then shine light at different patterns and then get the neuron to send out a specific signal that you wanted to communicate uh, with the rest of the cells. <clears throat> so we use blue light to be able to turn on, to be able to uh, introduce action potentials uh, in the cell. We use yellow light to uh, silence the cells. So every uh, yellow bar that you see here basically removes uh, an action potential. So if, when you combine these two colors of light together, you can really carve out and dictate what kind of a message 
you want a neuron to send out to the other cells. <coughs> and this is uh, how the actual experimental system works. So we inject the virus into the brain of a, of a mouse or a rat. In this case, it's a rat. And then we implant these optical fibers directly into the brain uh, of the animal. And these optical fibers are connected to a laser somewhere else, and now we can use a computer to control uh, the laser. So right now, the light is turned on, but you can flash the light in any pattern you want uh, to be able to control the cells. And so I'll show you a movie um, of how this system works. Um, so in this experiment, we have a mouse, and we, uh, we made the cells in the motor cortex, uh, the part of the cerebral cortex that controls uh, limb movement, so controls arm or leg movement. And then we implanted optical fiber to half, uh, to one side of the brain, uh, on the right side. So the signals in the brain, they cross and control the op opposite side of the body. So when we control the right side of the brain, it controls the left side of the limbs. And uh, by turning on the blue light and controlling the right motor cortex, we can cause the left limbs to move faster uh, and move with smaller, uh, shorter strokes. And you can see uh, this is what happens. So the mouse is sitting there. And as soon as the blue light goes on, turns on, you can see the mouse begins to walk uh, in a counterclockwise uh, orientation. And when the light goes off, then um, it stops moving in this uh, sort of uncontrolled fashion. <clears throat> So, so this experiment uh, was one of the experiments where we, uh, we found out for ourselves that we can actually go ahead and control uh, brain cells using light. <clears throat> and so using uh, this system, we can go and try to control different parts of the brain and see what do the different parts uh, do uh, in the function of the animal. So this is another experiment uh, where we did in the mouse this is a picture of what a mouse brain looks like. This is uh, toward the front, this is toward the back. And uh, there is a region in the, so this is a diagram, and there's a region uh, in the brain called the ventral tegmental area uh, that, um, that controls uh, the secretion of this uh, chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is a molecule that's involved in, um, people call that a happiness molecule. Uh, so it's involved in um, sort of sensing reward or uh, sort of being able to sense happiness. And uh, we uh, use light to try to control the cells in this ventral tegmental area to see what do these cells uh, do. And, uh, and so here are just some pictures of what these cells look like. Um, each one of these uh, round uh, cells, round things you see here is a, is a single uh, cell. And uh, we stain these cells with a marker called uh, tyrosine hydroxylase. This is an enzyme that these cells make, and we use this to identify the cells that produce dopamine. <clears throat> and, uh, and so I'll just show you a behavior experiment we did where we controlled, uh, we simulated the dopaminergic cells. So this is a chamber over here, and there are uh, two levers in the chamber. There's a lever over here, and there's a lever over there. And, there uh, and above each lever, there's a light. So if the lever has been pressed, uh, the light will turn off, and, uh, and it will come back on when the lever can be pressed again. And uh, the lever on the left side is connected to a laser, so if the animal presses the left lever, it will receive a burst of stimulation in the dopaminergic cells. And if it presses the lever on the right, uh, it wouldn't get any stimulation. <clears throat> so you can see there's the mouse with a fiber attached um, that's stimulating the, the ventral tegmental area. And, um, and because this lever is connected to the laser, the animal um, learns that when it presses this one, it will get the dopaminergic cells uh, activated uh, so that it, it, it receives a, a burst of this uh, chemical. When it presses the other one, it doesn't get anything, so it uh, learns not to, uh, to pr press this one so much. <clears throat> and so the dopamine molecule is involved in a lot of very important processes. Uh, it's involved in a major depression, because um, in a lot of the major depression patients, people um, ex uh, experience anhedonia, so they can't uh, take pleasure in things. Um, and uh, it's also involved in addiction, because in addiction, you develop uh, this habit uh, that you can't really control. 
And, uh, and that all involves uh, the, the doping energy system. And so using this kind of paradigm, we can begin to study uh, what do uh, this type of signaling do uh, in, in mediating these kinds of disease uh, processes. Um, so, so, so the first example was, was uh, about a system that allow you to control uh, the electrical signals within the brain to see how cell-to-cell -cell communication problems lead to disease. But in addition to that, um, there can be other contributors to disease, and that can be uh, in the form of genetic mutations. So we need to sort of have a way of figuring out uh, which genetic mutation uh, lead to the disease uh, state. Um, this is really inspired by all of the work and advances that have been uh, done in human genome sequencing. So especially the work that was led uh, by the folks here. Um, <clears throat> over the past uh, sort of almost a decade now, the number of genetic mutations that are correlated uh, or associated with disease has really grown exponentially. So this is a plot from the National Institute of Health. And uh, you can see that since 2005, the number of mutations that have been implicated in disease has really grown exponentially. So <clears throat> every one of these mutations used to be the career of a single graduate student or a single postdoc within a lab. <clears throat> so as you can imagine, we can, we can take plenty of graduate students and postdocs for, for, the, for the next you know, several hundred years. <clears throat> But, but that's not very good for, for us if we want to try to understand uh, what mutations cause disease, because not all of the mutations that are implicated or associated uh, actually lead to the disease state. So we need to develop ways so that we can screen through these mutations in a very fast uh, manner, so that we can go through tens or thousands of them um, at a time, rather than having 10,000 graduate students working on it. <clears throat> so the way we do that um, is, so actually, let me tell you a little bit more about how these mutations uh, work. So if you look into uh, the genome, the genome um, is basically a long string of DNA. And the DNA is organized into modules. And basically, uh, modules uh, like this, where there is a element, a fragment, that controls the, uh, that directs the cell to either make or not make uh, this gene. And then there's a terminator that uh, tells uh, where the gene uh, stops. So this is basically uh, the elementary sentence uh, within the genome. And then there are many, many sentences like this that, that are uh, tied together. And so this is what the sentence looks like. Uh, there's a controller that tells the cell to make it or not to make it. And then the gene actually is the instruction for the protein that, uh, that needs to be made. And then the stop signal simply tells uh, the controller to stop once it gets to here. So, the disease can result from uh, errors in the control signal. So if there's an error here that causes um, the cell to uh, express it when it shouldn't be expressed or to turn it off when it really should be turned on, uh, then there can be a disease. Um, and when there's an error in the gene sequence, if there's a mutation in the gene, uh, that can also uh, cause uh, a disease state. So there are many, many examples uh, like this, things like cystic fibrosis, or things like uh, autism spectrum disorder, um, and, and we're discovering it more and more. <clears throat> so in order to be able to um, study these mutations, uh, we actually need tools that allow us to interpret the genome uh, artificially. So a couple of things that uh, we have been working on recently, one is what I call actuator. So these are things that allow us to modulate gene expression. So in a cell, um, if there is a mutation in the controller, and this gene is not turned on, or the gene is um, turned on too much, then we can use an actuator to either turn on the gene or to uh, quiet it down. And that way we can try to see when we do that, uh, does the cell become normal again. And the other thing is uh, called editor that allows us to go into the genome and then make um, a change. Um, either we introduce a mutation that we suspect might be causing the disease, and we can use the editor uh, to introduce that mutation and see if it causes the problem. If it causes the problem, then we know uh, it's a causal mutation. And uh, the other way is we can use the editor to go into the genome and then replace the mutation. So if we know a mutation causes a problem, we can fix it um, and then be able to, uh, to treat the disease. So these are two things that we, uh, we need to develop to be able to uh, try to uh, better understand uh, genetic mutations. 
So the one thing that we need to be able to do that uh, is a way to be able to read the DNA. So we can sequence DNA using uh, DNA sequencers, and we can do that very, very well. But when you sequence the DNA, you end up killing the cell. So in the case where we want to actually study what happens, what, what a mutation does to a cell, or if you want to just fix the mutation, we actually want to make sure that the cell is still alive. So we need uh, living things that can read DNA. And so uh, the DNA is very long in the cell, so what we need to develop are proteins that can read along the strand of DNA and figure out where it needs to, to hone into. <clears throat> and, um, and the thing that we uh, found uh, that serves that purpose uh, is another protein derived from, from, the, the, from nature, and that's from this bacteria called Xanthomonas uh, oryzae. And this bacteria normally uh, colonizes rice plant. So it's, it lives on the rice plant leaves. And um, the rice plant has its own immune uh, system, so it can fend off the bacterial colonization. And um, the way that this bacteria continues to be able to live on the rice plant is through a Trojan horse type of mechanism. So what it does is that this bacteria will inject a protein into the plant cell. So this is what the diagram uh, shows over here. So the bacteria is, is sort of latched onto the plant cell over here, and uh, it injects uh, these proteins into the plant cell th through the plant cell wall. And when this protein goes into the plant cell, it will go into the nucleus and then bind to one of those controllers. And then it will tell the controller to turn on this gene that will turn off the immune system. So it's, so it's very, very neat um, <clears throat> and very, very clever. So what this protein, uh, what is unique about this protein is that it's able to go from the uh, microbial bacterial cell into the plant cell, into the genome, and then be able to read along the plant genome and find out that specific location within the genome. So we thought maybe we can use this uh, to, to do what we want to do. <clears throat> so this is what the, the plant protein looks like. Uh, it's, it's a long string. And uh, what is interesting is that in the middle of the protein, uh, there are these uh, sort of modules. Each one of these modules is like a Lego piece. You can find a module that targets uh, one type of DNA letter, or a module that targets another DNA letter, or another module that targets uh, uh, yet another DNA letter. There are four DNA bases, and there are four different kinds of modules that can target each one of these DNA bases. And you can take these modules put them together, shuffle them around in any specific order, and they will recognize the DNA uh, sequence according to the order that you put these modules together. So basically, you can take this protein, uh, swap these things around, and get a new protein that can recognize a new DNA sequence that you want to uh, be able to recognize uh, in, the, in, the, in the genome. <clears throat> and, uh, and earlier this year, the structure for this protein was uh, resolved by a group in Seattle and this is what the structure looks like. So uh, this gray uh, double helix here is the DNA. And then the color thing that wraps around the DNA uh, is, is this protein. And so each one of these, uh, so this is the side view. This is the top-down view. And uh, if you look top-down, each one of these colored uh, arms here is one of those modules. And uh, each one of these modules contacts with one of the DNA bases in the DNA. And you can basically switch these things around to recognize any uh, DNA sequence you want to recognize. So it's very, very neat. And so for us, uh, we, we developed a system where if you want to target a DNA sequence, suppose you want to target GCA, CAA, GT, all you have to do is you go into um, this, uh, this plate and you just cherry pick the individual modules. If you want to target G in the first position, you take uh, G1, you want C, you take C2, uh, A3, and so forth. So you can put them together uh, just like you do for, for anything else uh, that you're building. Uh, just build it in series, and you can target a completely new uh, DNA sequence. So now, using this system, we can hone in to any position we want uh, within the genome. So then the first thing that we, one of the things that we did is, uh, is to build an editor. The way we build an editor is by attaching a nuclease domain uh, onto this DNA uh, binding protein. So what the nucleus does is like a scissors. It will go into the genome. 
once this protein finds the right DNA sequence, the, uh, the nucleus will, will cut the DNA, or basically break it. When it breaks it, um, then we can uh, try to repair this and put in, the, uh, put in a mutation or to remove a mutation. And so this is, uh, this is how it works. <clears throat> so you build these uh, molecular sort of scissors, and uh, suppose there are some mutations in here that you want to repair. You uh, build a DNA binding protein, and you attach the nucleus onto this. So you put that into the cell, and then this, these uh, nucleases will, will cut the DNA. And then once it makes a double strand break, you can then put in a template that carries uh, the repair that you want to um, uh, repair uh, this mutation with. Uh, so so the, the cell will then uh, try to repair this broken end and uh, repair it along this uh, synthetic template and copy off the sequence here. So because the sequence you introduce doesn't have these mutations, uh, you can now uh, basically remove these mutations and repair, uh, repair the, the DNA. And so, so you can use this to repair uh, the, the, the mutation, but you can also use it to, to try to identify muta mutations that cause disease. And the way to do that is you can take a stem cell um, and then use what we call genome engineering, these editors, to be able to introduce a mutation uh, into this uh, otherwise healthy stem cell. And now you generate two different cells that differ only in a single mutation. And then when you convert these stem cells into, uh, for example, neurons, you can see whether or not the cell that carries a mutation uh, gives rise to a, a dysfunctioning abnormal neuron. And if that mutation uh, gives rise to a, a neuron that doesn't work as well, uh, then you know uh, that mutation has some function. Uh, whereas for other mutations, um, that may not do anything, you will just get a cell that carries the mutation, but with, with, uh, that derives a healthy cell. So using this kind, kind of methodology, uh, you can imagine synthetically taking any mutation. You don't have to go out and uh, collect uh, uh, tissue skin samples from many, many people. Uh, you can just take a single cell, a single cell line in the lab, and then use this method to synthetically generate any type of disease genotype. And uh, in that way, you can really quickly go through uh, many uh, mutations and try to figure out uh, if they cause a problem. <clears throat> so the other thing uh, that we can uh, build is uh, to build these actuators that bind to the controllers. So uh, you can either put an activation domain that will turn the gene on, or a repression domain that will turn the gene off, or you can uh, attach a domain that will modify the structure uh, within the, the genome, so how the DNA is packed uh, inside of the nucleus or you can do other type of uh, uh, modifications like changing uh, different marks on the DNA or um, be able to sort of put different pieces of the genome uh, together into, into the same vicinity. So using these editors and also actuators, uh, what we can do now is we can start to study uh, a variety of different kinds of genetic disease. So for example, in Huntington's disease, you have um, a uh, a duplication or extension of a repetitive uh, sequence. So what we can do is we can use editor, go into a Huntington cell, and then cut out uh, the, the repetitive sequence. And that way we can repair uh, the mutation. Uh, in the cases where you have REST syndrome, uh, where something has been mutated, or Engelman syndrome, uh, a gene that uh, has been mutated, we can uh, turn on the uh, non-mutated gene so that we can rescue uh, uh, the, the disease uh, phenotype. And likewise, for many of these other uh, diseases, uh, we can begin to have a way of trying to uh, correct these mutations. So finally, the third thing is um, using these kinds of genome engineering tools is not only important for biomedicine, but it really has a lot of applications for non-biomedical purposes as well. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, this, these are uh, s uh, silk that are generated by transgenic uh, silkworm. So what happened over here is that uh, a fluorescent protein was introduced into the region of the genome that encodes the silk protein. So you can imagine, so this is a, is a cool, fun demonstration, but you can imagine uh, introducing, uh, say, uh, uh, collagenase or some type of therapeutic molecule uh, into the silk so that when you make stitches during surgery, uh, the tissue will heal better. Uh, because you have a more functional type of, uh, uh, type of uh, fiber. 
So, so these kinds of uh, genome editors, genome actuators uh, can be applied in a variety of things like um, agricultural uh, animals or agricultural produce as well uh, to be able to generate even more uh, functional uh, type of uh, products. So, so in, in summary, um, that's basically all I, uh, I have to tell you today. Um, uh, what we're trying to do is really to build a biological engineering platform, um, a way so that we can take biological uh, organisms and try to engineer them uh, to make them more, more useful. And uh, these are just some of the, the things that uh, I told you about so far. Uh, you can learn more about these things uh, from these websites. Uh, the, the editors, actuators, you can learn more about at taueffectors.com. You can learn more about the optical neural control from, from the optogenetics.org. Uh, you can also find out uh, more information about what we do in the lab uh, from, from our lab website. <coughs> and these are just some of the folks in the lab. Uh, so so uh, Le Cheng and uh, Neville Sanjana uh, are two of the folks who uh, work quite a bit on the editors and actuators. Uh, Silvana and Mark are uh, graduate students uh, who are trying to be able to control uh, genes uh, in, the, in the genome. Uh, Lukash is trying to understand how certain genes are, are important in learning and memory. And uh, Patrick and, and Ben are also working on ways of trying to be able to better uh, read and, and write to the genome. Uh, so so that, that's all. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, we're sure. going to use the microphone uh, for questions. Oh, was that a request for the websites? Oh. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you sure. can, if you have questions, raise your hand. I'll bring the mic around. As you're investigating some of these like known you know, genetic diseases, mm -hmm. are you also finding other types of mutations that might have you know, more subtle type of effects and mm -hmm. you know, able to fix those oh. and observe you know, you know, more subtle effects you know, as a result of this? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's one thing that we're working on now is try to, um, because if you look at many of these diseases, especially the complex ones like Alzheimer or schizophrenia, um, it's probably not a single mutation that causes the problem. Because those single mutations that are so potent, they'll probably not survive in the gene pool. Uh, they will be selected out. So it's usually a combination of very weak, uh, but together in aggregate, uh, they will cause the disease. So that's one thing that we're trying to work on now is try to be able to introduce multiple of these mutations uh, or develop ways to be able to introduce multiple mutations uh, to understand their role. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, have you implemented any of this yet? Have you tried, like, with Huntington's or any uh -huh. of this to, uh, uh, or are you still, like, in the primary testing? Yeah, we're, we're still in the primary uh, development phase right now, but uh, we're, we're moving into animal models. Uh, yeah. So next time, hopefully, I'll tell you more. Yeah. Uh-huh. Is there... Is, uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Is there a limit to the number of nucleotides you can modify using this technique? Sorry, uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Is there a number of, is there a limit to the number of nucleotides you can modify using this technique of using the actuators? Um, is there a limit? Things? So the question is, is there a limit to the number of nucleotides that can be modified? Um, uh, we, we don't know what the upper bound is uh, right now. Um, if you approach the size of the genome, we probably can't do that uh, yet. Um, but um, for any short regions, a uh, couple hundred or a thousand, a couple thousand we can, we can do. Um. Hi. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> for your second example, um, uh -huh. I was wondering, um, are you at a stage where you're able to affect a large number of cells? So like with the diseases, I'm sure mm -hmm. like if you only fix one cell, it's not really going to do much. Yeah. So one thing that we work on in the lab is trying to uh, develop um, sort of uh, good viral systems so that we can uh, sort of uh, uh, deliver these uh, molecules to many, many cells. And, um, and so depending on the disease, you may or may not need to target many, many cells. Uh, so, for example, uh, in some diseases, uh, you may only need to target. So, for example, 
uh, in the Parkinson's disease example, uh, the stimulation was in a very small area of the brain. So in those kinds of uh, situations, you can probably just target a small area. But then for other things, um, you might have to target more, uh, more areas. And, and that will be sort of more disease specific. Yeah. So uh -huh. uh, you were talking about there might be a series of mutations involved in something as complex as schizophrenia or Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Is there a good animal model to see if what you're developing in the if there's so much at play and we don't really know what the genetics are of it, right. how will you know if right. you're creating a model like that? Right, right. Um, so right now, there are, there are no perfect models for uh, these kind of complex uh, neurological or psychiatric uh, diseases. Um, but that's because we are really just getting started. Um, the technologies for being able to make these animals, uh, animal models, are just sort of coming online, uh, like the ones that I told you about today. Uh, so I think in the next five years, you will see a lot of progress. Yeah, um, that's definitely one of the most exciting area. Uh, the second area, uh, just one second, uh, is uh, um, we can actually take stem cells as a model uh, as well. So taken, taking uh, skin cells that you can reprogram into a stem cell and the engineering mutations uh, that you suspect uh, might be causing problems, uh, and, then, and then taking those stem cells and then converting them into neurons and study what happens to those neurons, uh, that can be another way of trying to uh, identify causal uh, genetic mutations. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, have you thought of using this in possible um, uh -huh. cancer treatments in the future that are probably less risky um, than our current treatments? Like, have you, <clears throat> have you yeah. considered um, using this in uh, oncology? Yeah, uh, definitely, we definitely thought about it. Um, and uh, cancer would be a great uh, area to try to use some of these new uh, therapeutic strategies. Uh, you can imagine genes that are turning on that cause uh, oncogenesis. Uh, and if you can turn them off, then maybe you can treat the cancer. Um, but one problem with cancer is actually with delivery. So just like the question that was asked before, uh, in cancer, often you have to really penetrate uh, the entire tumor. Uh, you cannot just get the cells that are on the surface of the tumor. You have to get deep inside. And in uh, later stage cancer, uh, when after metastasis, um, there will be cells throughout the body, and then you have to target uh, in more areas. Um, so uh, we're trying to figure out what might be the most, um, most effective uh, delivery system. Uh, and then once we do that, then definitely that will be a really good target. <clears throat> What's the resolution? How many is down to how many cells? What kind of size? Right. So, um, so we usually send in light uh, to try to drive a group of cells. Uh, usually, uh, the brain volume that we're stimulating is around half a millimeter in diameter. Um, and so, within that region, um, depending on how many cells are targeted, um, because we don't modulate every single cell like with an electrode. Um, so, in this case, I think we're probably modulating like uh, fifteen thousand or so cells. Um, but in other parts of the brain, there can be more, more dense or less dense. Um, but you don't have to drive too many cells to get a behavior sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Um, so sometimes when you drive uh, 20 or 30 cells, you can get, get a behavior. Yeah. Sure. Can the dopamine stimulation be used in our painkillers? Um, yeah, so the question is, can uh, dopamine stimulation be used to treat pain uh, as a painkiller. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any pain drugs that uh, control the dopamine system. Uh, there are other brain systems that, uh, like endorphin systems, that can, uh, that can treat pain. Yeah. But, um, but maybe it, it's worth trying. I think it's something that people haven't uh, tried. So uh, when you get into a lab, you should, you should try that. <laughs> Actually, you can come over here and try it. Intensity or frequency of the light matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the light, the, both the intensity and the frequency matters. Um, the intensity matters because you need to drive uh, a, a sufficient number of these uh, proteins in the cell to be able to get a cell to send off a signal. Uh, so each uh, protein uh, will uh, cause the electrical change of, uh, say, a couple of femtosiemens. Uh, so you need to have enough to be able to get, say, a millivolt of deflection uh, in the membrane potential change. 
So, um, so you need to have sufficient power to activate all of those proteins. Uh, the color also change, uh, is important because the proteins uh, are responsive to a specific color of light. Uh, so if we stimulate using red light or infrared light, then we wouldn't be able to activate this protein. But there are other proteins in nature that respond to other color, colors of light. Um, so it depends on which protein uh, you use. Yeah, uh, we did. So with every protein that we borrow from a plant or algae, we we'll actually shine the whole spectrum of light. So we'll take all the way from purple uh, to red and see uh, at what color does it respond the most. And then, uh, and then we can generate a, generate a, a plot to see uh, what is the response. Yeah, there's another question back there. Any ideas or investigation around using these techniques for uh, biofeedback? Um, yeah, there are actually several groups. Um, one over at uh, University of Southern California uh, that has been exploring and using the system uh, to uh, help repair, say, uh, injured spinal cord so they can relay signals from, from the central brain to the limbs. Um, there are several groups working on that uh, pretty actively right now. Yeah. And there's a, I think there's another question. The algae protein that you're using to sense light, does it, have, does it work in its native form to get the neurons active, or did you need to modify it? And if so, what modifications were required in order for it to turn on the neurons? Right. Yeah, that's another good question. So these proteins are found in algae, uh, which is more similar to plants uh, than to animals. Uh, so um, getting a plant protein to work in, a, in an animal cell is not as simple. Um, so uh, depending on the, the protein, uh, the channel rhodopsin, the blue light activating protein, uh, works right out of the box. Uh, but there are other proteins that we have to modify. Um, the major modification we do is try to get it onto the membrane of the, of the neuron cell. Um, and uh, usually we take other neuron proteins that go to the uh, membrane, and we take the signal that those proteins use uh, and attach them onto the uh, microbial protein to get them back onto the uh, neuronal membrane. Yeah? When the neuron that has the, uh, when the neuron that has the protein undergoes mitosis, will it uh, undergo mitosis with the, uh -huh. will it have the protein with the genetic sequence? Um, yeah, the neuron, uh, so the virus that we use will insert the gene into the genome of the cell uh, so that it will carry the, the gene for, for the life of that cell. Um, yeah, so it will last for a long time. Um, when you talk about s using this treatment for stitching, can the actuators make platelets and skin scales reproduce faster? Uh, can, can the actuators? actuators? Um, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, so actually, um, there's, a, there's a whole community out there called the biohacking community. Uh, I don't know if you know about this. Uh, there was an article in The Economist about it. Uh, so there are these athletes that will go to um, sort of small countries in Eastern Europe and get injections of viruses that cause uh, their red blood cells to make more hemoglobin uh, so that they can run faster or, or so forth. Uh, and some of the strategies they, they use is to be able to uh, make more of a certain kind of protein like hemoglobin. Uh, so you can certainly use actuators to turn on more. But I don't recommend that. Uh, I think <laughs> I would. <laughs> So um, before I invite you all to the reception that we have outside, let's just give uh, Feng one more big round of applause. <laughs>